um, if you'd like, I can take notes below a line and we can have a section up above for questions. They don't get lost. Sure, that's a good idea. Yeah, that so. way we can, I can capture things. So basically just, yeah, you got it, exactly. Okay, um, so you should be good to go. If y'all want a separate recording of this um, that will also record the chat, I can set that up as well while I'm in here. That'd be great. Okay. Um, oops. Actually, Oren, I've made you the host again, so you'll have to hit the record button. Okay. So do I just um, I just go to record and then say in the cloud? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And then, so that's a separate one. Um, we'll actually transcode the stream after it's done and put it back on the, the site, but this will actually give you access to the chat and everything else. And I can share that with y'all after the fact. Awesome, thanks. Oh, yep. Jimmy. And we are making you a co-host. Okay. J Jimmy, quick question. Um, are we expected to, to watch to see if there are any, I didn't look at the page recently. Is there, are there gonna be comments made on the, the web page as well or can we ignore, safely ignore that? Um, there could be comments made on the web page as well. Okay, so I'll grab but, that. But there will be um, an opportunity for people to to actually join in, join the Zoom. So, so there's Etherpad and okay. So, are we supposed to watch the website? Uh, yeah, you might just keep an eye on the chat just to see if anything pops in. If a if a new message comes in, it should say. But I, I'll also put a message in there to direct people to the Zoom if they want to participate. Does that work? Yeah, that'd be great. Or, or, or if they want to put it in the Etherpad, that's another option for folks. Okay, cool. I will put Thanks. both up. All right, have a good session. <laughs> All right. So, so is it true that people can join either through Zoom or just on the website if they just want to watch? without participating? Is that how that works? Um, I believe so. Yeah. Okay, so then we don't really know the size of the audience. They won't really do much good if they're just participating. That, that'll be drag. I hope they all join through Zoom. Right. I, I'm gonna go to that page also just to see if I can. Yeah, let's go to the page and just put in please participate directly through Zoom. Yeah. I'll look my schedule. That's in one minute. So let me share my screen now so that people know what this forum is about. Yes. I was say that's a great idea. Jimmy put put it in already. Oh, cool. Can you see my screen? Yes. It, the version that we're seeing has the slides on the left as well. Right, I'm trying to fix that. How about now? They're perfect. So, so while I'm sharing the screen, I won't be able to check anything else like Etherpad or anything. So I'm going to leave that to you guys, okay? Sure. Well, Ron, if you didn't already, can you click record? Oh, you did already, Never mind. Okay. Well, I think we've started.
we give it another minute or two, Hui, before we start? Yeah, sure. So in case anyone is watching this from the website, we encourage you to join through the Zoom meeting so that you can have a more an active um, participation with us. Yeah, we definitely want this to be a conversation. Like we have a fair number of people now. Should we? Yeah, we can start. That's fine. Okay. We do you want to kick it off? Right. So sure. So so everyone, welcome to the Project Series Forum. And my name is Hui Lei, and Professor Oran Krieger and I will be moderating this forum together. Um. So um. So this uh, project, uh, basic this forum and project are associated with the open infrastructure uh, labs. So let's briefly um, introduce, introduce that lab. And also while Oran and I talk, we want to maybe say interactive uh, conversation. So feel free to jump in and ask questions and make comments. And our presentation is meant to, to see the conversation, right? So feel free to, to jump in anytime you want. So Oran. So the general idea between open infrastructure labs, this was um, Michael described it in the keynote uh, yesterday. Um, the goal is to kind of bridge the gap between operators and open source developers, to have a real cloud that the open source community has access to. Um, we're creating prescriptive cloud in a box offerings that will be operated for real, initially in the MOC, then replicated to multiple clouds, um, first starting with academia and federated together. And to have the open source community have access to a real cloud, be able to see the problems that operators are facing and operators be directly sort of eventually going all the way to, to integrating upstream code very rapidly into a cloud that people are actually using. Um, so that's the general idea of this. And in this, what we're doing is we're sort of saying, this isn't about one open source project. This is about all the open source projects that are needed to create a real cloud that users are actually using. Um, today in the MOC, we have over 10,000 users of services on top of it, and we expect this to kind of grow substantially um, as we kick up the next phase, uh, the New England Research Cloud. So, um, so this involves AI layers, big data, data set repository, storage compute, function as a service, everything that we want in the way Michael described in the keynote is we want to actually be able to stand all those layers up in a consistent way with the automation around doing that so that multiple clouds are offering the exact same services in the exact same way um, and them federate together. That's the, the focus on open infrastructure labs that, that um, the first focus in some sense is about um, allowing that standardization and prescriptiveness and federation. But in doing that, it actually allows for research across these different layers. Um, there's a set of specific projects um, we're going to focus on one of those highlight in blue, the Sears one. We do you want to kind of describe that, get into that? Yeah. Um, okay. I'm having problems. All right. So uh, as an uh, oral mentioned, right, Sears is part of the open infrastructure labs. Um, so why do we want to have this project, right? Uh, today, uh, many companies um, have to support emerging new workload patterns, right? One of them is what we call continuous uh, data streaming, where you have um, data streams uh, generated uh, from um, all kinds of sensors and events continuously. And then we want to be able to um, cleanse and, and curate the data. We want to manage the quality of data and then protect the privacy of data subjects and owners. We also want to be able to integrate the streaming data with historical data and then, and then uh, generate insights and make predictions. So all such curation and prediction will have to happen in real time, 
that places a huge demand on the underlying infrastructure, right? Another workload pattern is what we call passive, massively parallel data processing. If you look at uh, machine learning jobs or map reduced jobs, they all involve a large number of concurrent threads and uh, processing data in parallel against a huge data set. So that also um, imposes requirement on the underlying data bandwidth. So on the one hand, we have this new workload patterns that have uh, new demands. On the other hand, our computing infrastructure is becoming more and more complicated. We're moving towards what we call hybrid multi-cloud, right? Where um, we have all the computing resources that are heterogene heterogeneous, whether it's CPU, GPU, um, um, uh, F, uh, FPGA or all kinds of storage systems, right? HDD, SDD, and SCM and things like that. So since systems are becoming more heterogeneous and also they are also becoming more disaggregated. So, so on, the, on the one hand, we have very demanding workloads. On the other hand, we have a, a very a more and more complicated computing infrastructure. So how can we uh, tackle those challenges? So we feel that a promising direction is to, um, to um, enhance the coordination between compute and storage. What do we mean by that, right? Today, computer system is highly stratified, right? There are different layers of the system. There's storage, storage layer, there's compute layer, there's this application layer and so forth. People are used to doing design, development and innovation within the boundary of each layer, right? So they only focus on that layer itself for good reasons of modularity and maintainability and things like that. However, those different layers have very well-defined and restrictive interface and that um, limits the kind of information available to each layer. So we feel that if we can somehow bridge the semantic gap between those layers so that a lower layer can have information, can have more information on the higher uh, level semantics, then the lower layer will be able to do more intelligent things, will become uh, smarter and, and therefore um, deliver a better performance. Just think about compute and storage, right? Today, uh, the interface between compute and storage is very restrictive, right? I request an object or a block, and then you give me the content. So it's a very simple API. We conjecture, right? If somehow the storage layer can have more information about what kind of, what kind of data processing we're trying to do, what kind of application we're trying to support, then we can make more intelligent decisions in terms of how to do caching, right? How to do other, uh, all kinds of storage management to improve the overall performance. So that's what project series is, is about by facilitating better or enhanced coordination between compute and storage uh, through leveraging uh, higher level semantics. So project series will not be from scratch, will be building upon multiple existing open source projects. Let's take a quick look at those projects. So all right. Or, um, Sorry, I always forget to unmute. So there's a series of projects that has been going on in the Mass Open Cloud, um, jointly supervised by Peter Desnoyers and myself um, with a large team of students working on this. The first one is sort of the caching layer um, where we've been cached, de developing a multi-layer cache on the access side of, of the network bottlenecks within the data center. Um, and so the idea here is to actually be able to share information um, to uh, across these layers. So we're putting now storage where compute is actually residing. So we're, we're trying to cache the data where the compute is, but also manages a global cache. Part of the idea here is, is as a cooperative cache or collective cache, um, it may well be that, you know, if, um, if new data set is being accessed in one cluster, that's a really good predictor that the data is gonna be accessing another cluster. Layered on top of that, we've been building this service called Cariz, which is kind of a controller for that cache. Um, and again, this even more violates that boundary between compute and storage, because what we've been doing is extracting the direct acyclic graph of what compute jobs are going to be happening out of Spark and PIG environments. Um, and using that, knowing that we actually know the future of accesses from these different environments to inform what data is being prefetched and cached and ejected from the cache. So again, these are sort of clear demonstrations of where we're trying to 
in some sense violate those traditional interfaces to get much, much higher performance. Um, we've been able to extract those DAGs from multiple environments, and we've been able to further um, use the historical information about how long jobs take with different amounts of caching to um, achieve much, much higher performance for, um, for applications at the end by actually caching portions of their data sets. Um, we want to go even a step further than that. We want to start understanding that this is a parquet file or an arrow file, um, or even starting to integrate um, with the Red Hat team S3 select into these interfaces. So we're caching only the data people are actually accessing. There's semantic information that caching. Um, the last kind of project we've been doing that sort of, I guess, violates the historical boundary um, is, is implementing uh, mutable storage over immutable. Um, so what we've been doing is building a block store. Um, so, uh, so essentially the equivalent of um, um, the radius block device um, or um, elastic block storage. Um, and we're using a local NVMe RAM as a write back cache, um, but the write backs are actually happening out of place and we're doing it over immutable storage in the back end. And so what that means is that the client is actually controlling where the data is stored to. And you only actually can see at the client side um, that combination of this is really volume storage. Um, that results in massive acceleration. Um, and um, we can go into more details on that if people are interested later on. I don't wanna go into too much. But these are sort of three example projects that sort of show how breaking that boundary and in the interface between compute and storage really can result in dramatic performance improvements. We we'll back to you. All right. So and another project in this area is what we call the semantics aware NDP and caching. Um, there are three aspects in this project. The first one is near data processing, which means we want to push data processing tasks uh, from the compute uh, cluster to the storage cluster. Um, this is different from existing work on NDP. If you look at existing work in Spark or S3, basically they're only pushing down very basic filtering and selection kind of operations. Here, we actually want to push down a much a broader array of operations, not just filtering, also aggregations like uh, join, group by, and search. We also want to push down AI functions like data shuffling and classification and so forth. And in addition, we want to allow users to define their own functions and push down those UDFs as well. So that will be one uh, key differentiation for the kind of NDP we are trying to support. Um, another aspect of the work is multimodal caching, right? If you look at a traditional ca uh, cache, you just caches a uh, source data from the uh, storage system. But here we want to uh, cache additional modalities of data as well, including intermediate data, I'm sorry, yeah, intermediate data, meaning the compu intermediate computation results so that we can just access those results immediately directly without recomputing anything, right? Another kind of data data with a cache is metadata. For example, information on the on on the index values on what kind of information, what kind of data is stored within each partition. And we feel that kind of metadata can help us um, make a, a better decision on what partitions to access and, and what partitions we can safely skip. Right. Another kind of thing we want to cache is repartition data. If we can somehow repartition data based on the workload, then we can um, uh, facilitate access a, 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 as well. So basically this is the second aspect, multimodal caching, not just source data caching, but other forms of data as well. And then the third aspect is the semantics aware aspect. We, when we talk about NDP, when we're talking about uh, multimodal caching, we're actually talking about multiple individual techniques. And then how do we uh, coordinate those techniques? How do we make intelligent decisions within each technique? This is where we want to break the um, system boundary. We want to leverage information from the compute side, from the application side, to make those decisions more intelligent and more, more automatic, right? So that's the, that's the gist of, of this project. So I hope this gives you an idea on the kind of technologies we think that can be useful, right, to address today's performance problem um, in a hybrid cloud e e environment. 
And this is where we want to have an open discussion with everyone here. Um, specifically, these are the questions um, we um, want to ask you, meaning, do you feel like this is the right direction we're trying to explore? And then, then if so, what are the questions you can think of that you want us to discuss as a group today, right? And also, um, in addition to the things we just described, what are the other innovation opportunities you see in this area? And what are the hard technical problems we have to solve? And also, we saw multiple um, projects already we're building on, and then there are also um, other related initiatives in other organizations, other foundations, how can all these different efforts come together to form a coordinated, right, big, big, big effort? So those are some of the things we have in mind, and then we'd like to have that discussion with everyone, everyone here. Yeah, and to add kind of last point here is that, you know, this this opportunity um, to kind of violate the boundaries between projects that's something that's going on all, all the time in kind of proprietary fashion inside the big public clouds, right? And what we're trying to do is provide the open source community the way to do that and then expose it, say, through the MOC to real end users. Um, so we have all these people doing AI on top of the cloud that are doing, um, that are using these different services. And so um, this gives us the opportunity to actually violate those boundaries. And so we're really, we wanted to actually ask this community, what do you want to see happen? And further, how do we want to you know, some of these projects that we just outlined in some sense are research projects, research projects that break those boundaries. Um, what are their existing open source projects um, from this community and how do they, how do we see that sort of working together between the broader open source community and the research community, which I guess I'm more of a representative of. So we're hoping at this point, people start jumping in with questions or comments, either on the etherpad or, or actually just um, unmute yourself and join the conversation. And, and we're also hoping that we have answers for your question. Or that we don't, but they're interesting. Okay, uh, this is Tony. I, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, may I ask? Sure, Please. go ahead. All right. Um, NDP has been around for quite some times. Uh, as far as I know, uh, a lot of company uh, and different vendors have their own implementation to support various computer use case. Uh, for example, SSD vendor use SSD controller to offload story side compute task into SSD itself. Uh, data uh, accelerator has been built based on certain FPGA or certain dedicated hardware to offload a specific workload, right? Uh, realize that there is a need for standardize those efforts among industry and uh, uh, open source, SNIR has several groups are working toward that goal. So is serious project intention to collaborate with the SNIR uh, related groups and uh, standardize the NDP, at least uh, in the area uh, you guys mentioned about like big data AI? Uh, this is the first question. So maybe I, I go, go ahead. All right, go ahead. So, so um, I guess I tend to be. I, I sort of think that standardization efforts take a number of generations. What what I'm hoping that we're going to be pushing really aggressively for is POCs in common environments with real users, right? Where we demonstrate it at some level of scale. So um, I think we're complementary to that, and I think we love to collaborate with those standardization efforts, but at the same time, in some of these cases, we're really pre-standardization, right? And let's actually figure out what kind of gains we're gonna get from that. But Tony, you know a lot more about that. Does that make sense? Or should we really be, do they actually, is that evolved enough that we should be adopting things that they already have standardized? Uh, I, I think that that's a, a great answer. Uh, I, uh, as far as I know, right, SNIR has a, a, a certain uh, standard, try to standardize several like a uh, uh, in-memory compute and uh, story side compute uh, effort. And uh, uh, they also try to develop uh, different uh, technology. So I, I, I just uh, 
want to make sure that uh, this great project and the technology can, can contribute uh, in the early stage so that uh, SNEAR, all those uh, party have a, at least some consensus that uh, uh, serious is in the picture. So otherwise, uh, if it's the, the, the past two di uh, diverge, it's hard to, 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 to combine them all together in later. So, so earlier involvement, maybe I, I do uh, understand that your, your concern that it's really early stage, but at least uh, maybe uh, have a loose collaboration uh, is, is, is an approach, you know, at least the, the series is in their mind of, you know, um, uh, when they right. are trying to, you know, make a, as a standard, right? So, so it's right, so that's a concern. Yeah. Tony, this is my take, right? So first I feel that the term near data processing or NDP is a abused term. When you talk about talk to people who are working on NDP, they may tell you very different things. Um, so my take is that if you look at the memory hierarchy, the main memory, right, uh, storage class memory, SSD, and things like that, there's ongoing work to push computation to each layer of that hierarchy, right? So first, not all NDP work are the same, meaning they're really focusing on different parts of the memory hierarchy, that's one thing. And secondly, if you, you look at what we are doing, um, what we're, at least what we're trying to focus in series is on a different aspect from the aspects you have mentioned. We are focusing on how to push uh, the computation from the uh, analytics cluster to the storage cluster over the network. So that's the major hub we're focusing on initially because we feel that's the path that will make the biggest difference. Obviously, in ultimately, right, we will have to uh, leverage uh, uh, all the work and then be able to push computation all the way down through the memory hierarchy. But right now, we won't be able to uh, cover all the, all the uh, hubs on that path. We're really focusing on the most important hub, which is from the uh, analytics cluster to the storage cluster. So that's for one, I want to clarify. Uh, we're in the, at, at least in the beginning, we're not trying to conquer, conquer the entire uh, memory hierarchy. So that's one thing. And, 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 and then, so in that sense, our work is complementary to what Senior is focusing on. And secondly, I agree with you and Oran in the sense that standardization will have to come after the technology is more mature. Uh, right now, we're still at the phase that we're developing the innovation, developing the technology itself. Great. I wanted to, Peter Desnoyer is Northeastern. I wanted to uh, follow on with what uh, we said here. What, what we have in this here is seems like something where, you know, I've got a, actually, Iran and I both have long industry careers and I've been burned multiple times through my career by various standards group interactions um, like the ATM forum. So um, I think here what we're seeing is that because of the mix of open source and also um, it, you know, academic research, we have something where the initial trial implementations of things that you know, in proprietary, in most companies would be done internally as proofs of concept are instead happening in the open here. So this is really the work that needs to, to come out and possibly fail, you know, before, you know, but hopefully work before you can coalesce around the standard as opposed to, you know, um, my early career was marked by following standards where people got way out, of, out ahead of the technology and went in directions that it turned out didn't work. And I really, I really like that point is that one of the things we'd really like to invite is people that have other aspects of this that they're working on to kind of experiment on it in the open, it, you know, demonstrate it in say the MOC, show, expose it to real users. And so we could do comparisons on the same hardware in the same kind of environment um, with real usage. I mean, that's kind of how the public cloud is so successful in innovating is they develop things and they have experimental services and people start using them and then they can evolve them rapidly.